Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Vitajte na festival Dive In. Welcome to the Dive In Festival. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Welcome to Dive In. Mabuhay sa Dive In Kapistahan. Üdvözlöm ka Dive In Festivalon. Dabro pasalvit na Festival Dive In. Buhay mabayim. Bolit slori tanon. Dive In utsare. Apna de shokol ke jalan. Shadow amontran. Benvenuti al Diving Festival. Diving Festival in Hoshkadis. Diversity and inclusion are two simultaneous concepts, and none of them will succeed without the support of the other. iJoy is a great platform to socially and professionally exercise these concepts. From a personal experience, I believe that iJoy family is diverse such that we come from different cultural backgrounds, age groups, professional experience, and so on. I also believe one of the keys to our success is the mutual understanding and respect that we have for one another, regardless of our differences. Diversity and inclusion is important in my career progression, and I'm treated fairly and equally. At the same time, I can learn from people who come from different diverse backgrounds. Inclusion culture at IGI is very important to me, as it makes me feel valued, appreciated, and that I belong. This had allowed our diversified workforce to speak out, seize opportunities, and thrive on a personal as well as on an organizational level. Diversity and inclusion is important to me because I believe in equality. To be able to achieve my potential, I would like to be treated and judged based on skills and qualifications, rather than gender or culture. Diversity and inclusion is important to me because it sets a base for an environment of freedom and justice a place where everyone's voice is heard and acknowledged. I really like the Dive-In Festival. I helped organize it here in Jordan for three years in a row. Dive-In is global and versatile. We can shed light on diversity and inclusion in any way we want and anywhere we prefer. The insurance community gets together all over the world, all unified at the same time to discuss the same issue. It is wonderful to be part of that. Working from home during the pandemic had meant that I needed to assume several roles, one as an auditor at IGI and others as a social counselor, entertainer, teacher and mother of my boys. I was amazed of how understanding, patient and brave they were during those difficult circumstances and I hope that I have been successful in my two roles. When I worked from home during the pandemic, I was happy that I had a routine that included taking care of my personal health. The time that I used to spend before going to work and coming back, I replaced it with working out and taking nature walks. Generally speaking, working from home has not been challenging for me, despite of its difficulty at the beginning, as it has allowed me to improve my time management skills and decrease my dependency on my follow-up colleagues. However, working from home has made me miss the work environment and all the social interaction accompanied with it. During this crisis, I was inspired by people's solidarity and how we got out of our way to help support our community, reminding ourselves that we are not alone in this.
And with that, I would I'd like to introduce your moderator for today, Ida Abu Jabbar. Ida, you have the floor. Thank you, Richard. Welcome to Dive In Jordan. What a pleasure it is to be part of this worldwide initiative that has not been hindered by the challenging times that we find ourselves in. The resilience of humans is simply amazing. This year's virtual events have the upside of everyone sharing their ideas, initiatives, activities across the world, all together, and we all have a chance to see what the other is doing. Jordan's event is sponsored by International General Insurance, IGI, and is in partnership with Women as Partners in Progress, the WPP, the World of Letters, and Tomorrow Today Global. This is the third year running that IGI has hosted the Dive In Festival here in Jordan and has partnered with the WPP, a MENA region network featuring female leaders whose mission it is to empower women and combat pressing gender issues. At IGI, diversity and inclusion lies at the heart of our social responsibility. We have a history of investing in our communities and in supporting causes that align with our values. At IGIs, we have offices that span over four continents. So by virtue of our DNA, we are diverse in every level, gender, race, religion, color, and we value and embrace our differences. I hope you enjoyed the video of some of my IGI colleagues sharing how they felt about diversity and inclusion, why they liked the Dive In Festival, and of course, the challenges and perhaps the opportunities that they had during lockdown. So without further ado, let's kick off the events of this session. We have two wonderful speakers aligned. Um, as Richard told you, uh, there'll be a Q&A session that will follow the presentations. But please feel free to send your Q&As anytime during the session. I would like to now uh, introduce our first speaker, Mayada Abu Jabr. Mayada is an internationally renowned advocate in women's rights and gender equality. She's a dynamic and inspirational leader to all. She has a passion for innovation and social entrepreneurship to drive economic social and educational development. She's the director of the WPP. She is uh, the founder and CEO of World of Letters, a social enterprise dedicated to promoting equality in the MENA region. To top it all off, she's a Brookings Institute Global Scholar. She will talk to us about balancing the leadership traits in the COVID-19 era. The floor is yours, Mayada. Thank you very much, Aida, for uh, this uh, great introduction. I am very honored uh, to be for the third year uh, in a row to be part of the um, IGI uh, Dive In Festival. Uh, we are also proud uh, as the Women as Partner in Progress uh, Network uh, to work with IGI being a role model, a private sector role model in diversity and inclusion. Uh, to speak about um, uh, the, the different traits that are needed uh, during COVID-19 leadership, uh, I'm going to share my slides with you, so give me a few minutes. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay, so um, leadership during the COVID-19, we are, the before I move on, the WPP, or Women as Partners in Progress, is... Uh, um, is funded by the State Department, MAPI, and it's uh, uh, implemented in partnership with the Gibran Chair for Value and Peace uh, of the University of Maryland. Um, let's start with the leadership scene. I'm sure all of you must have seen this, uh, uh, this uh, picture before, uh, stating uh, the, the role that women have uh, taken during the COVID-19. Countries with women in leadership position have suffered six times fewer confirmed deaths during COVID-19 uh, than governments that are led by men. And this has been around in the social media, and we're like applauding women for their great job. However, only 8% of leaders in the world are women. So I'm gonna, just going to dig deeper into why women did so well during the, uh, the COVID-19. So this complex diagram 
uh, gives you seven women uh, leaders. And I'm going to start with Germany on the upper left, Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel. If you can see the amount of death, which is the box that says rest in peace, 113 with the highest number of population. Uh, what was important about her policy is that she was very honest. And from the beginning, she was truthful, uh, clear communication. She said, you know, 70% of the population may get affected. And she says it's serious and we need to take serious action. That's her leadership style, right? Then let's go to <clears throat> Norway, 49 uh, death per million, 170,000 uh, testing. Her policy was quite innovative. She spoke a lot on TV and she spoke to the children. She told them, you know, it's okay to feel scared. We will, and, and she would spoke in love and empathy. Let's go to Bangladesh. Bangladesh country known that has gone through so many natural disasters being on a, a floodplain. She, um, she also spoke, she's known as the chief panic diffuser, diffuse panic. She also forbid people, refrain people from using the word lockdown. And she spoke to people again in compassion, a great communicator. And she also worked trans, trans, um, uh, trans countries. So she learned from, uh, from different parts of, the, uh, of her neighboring country. Taiwan, the earliest to take action they introduced 124 measures, and you must have seen them also on TV, how they've used different measures to, um, uh, to combat COVID-19 or to prevent from COVID-19. She, she was decisive, and she was quick in action and collaborative. So the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda, as you know, only five deaths per million. Again, she, she had clarity, decisiveness. She spoke with compassion. Finland, uh, Prime Minister Sana, who's who's youth, and she spoke to youth, and of course, what did she use? She used the social media platform and uh, used uh, influencers to assist. Iceland as well, 29 per, uh, 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 per million, death, also offering uh, citizens, uh, it had a very strong tracking system. By the way, the amount of testing they did was 715,000 testing, and they're the ones who actually found out about the asymptomatic uh, cases. So all these great women doing really well, some with large countries, some were heading large countries, and some were smaller. Let's look at men. Oh, try to go. Oops. Sorry, one minute. It's not moving. Okay. So the men, uh, the USA, 614 per million death. Uh, the problem was that there was, uh, they downplayed the threat. Uh, they felt it was going to go away. There was a lot of a blame game. And then maybe the media, are they saying the real thing or not? They didn't really listen to the health right officials. And uh, the leadership was a bit inflexible. There was some kind of superiority, individualism. So the numbers were high. Although, look at the testing, 290,000 text testing. UK, 614 out of a million. Uh, again, uh, there was a denial. Um, it was, uh, it was, um, they didn't listen really to the importance of public health, health, they didn't invest in public health, and again, there was a confusion between the government and the science, so there wasn't this communal uh, response. Pakistan, also quite inconsistent uh, messaging. In the beginning, they did a fast lockdown, then there was no lockdown, there were contradictory messaging, uh, there was uh, autonomous lead uh, leadership, and there is kind of a domination. Brazil, 638 out of a million cases. Again, there was a mass outbreak. Uh, uh, there, was, um, uh, there was no social distancing, no lockdown, nothing is happening, and again, domination. So if you see, there is a kind of a difference in the traits that were used by men and women. Now, you may say, well, women are leading smaller organizations, so smaller countries. But if you look at countries of the same size, if you look at New Zealand and Ireland, look at the death per, uh, per thousand. Um, and look at it here. Look at Angela, look at Germany as compared to UK. And look at Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh as uh, compared to Pakistan. So in all cases, you see that there are less death in countries that are led by men, uh, by women leaders. But why? Why is the reason? Uh, I'm going to go through three slides of explaining why is, why is the reason. So is it a different kind of crisis? Uh, for men, uh, do they want to, did they see it as a security risk? Let's kill it. It's a war. Let's start. Many leaders felt that they have to use super masculine, super strong, inflexible approaches uh, to it as, as if it's a war. 
Women leaders looked at it more of a health risk, right? Health crisis. So let's look at it in a care way. Um, maybe we need to live up to, they didn't want to live up to the expectation. They didn't want to use this toxic masculinity, so they used more of this care approach. Why, again? Sorry, every time I play with the... Uh, again, uh, it's a crisis solved by care. Women, women bring in into the table life experiences of uh, reacting to the crisis uh, in, in, a, in a care way. Uh, the majority of essential workers in the front light are, are in the care workers and health workers. So, and they're also socialized uh, to, to be caretakers and, uh, uh, and empathetic. Let's look at Jacinda as well. Uh, it needs a communal solution, and that's what she did. Even, this is uh, actually one of the, uh, her uh, uh, press, uh, uh, when she was speaking to the press, look at her showing uh, um, uh, 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 this uh, graph that shows in a very simple way, talking to the, uh, to, the, to the whole community and to her whole country, how this is affect, if we take measures, how it would be affect, affected as men and women. She believed in collaboration is the solution, and she believed that communal, communal uh, com working as a community is a solution. Uh, so they pr prioritize preventive measures as compared to uh, as a communal interest. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Sorry, okay. So why? Basically, the way women leaders were is that they built on their feminine traits. What are the feminine traits we're talking about? They use a combination of empathy and communal support that are needed for their citizens. They were very receptive to the problems. They were responsive in a nurturing way. And they use these feminine strengths that you can see on the right side, subjectivity, intuition, uh, multiplicity, uh, re uh, relation, uh, relatedness, nurturing, cooperation. So these were the feminine traits that were actually uh, highlighted when they were working. But are these traits biological factors? That means, are these traits specifically for a different, for a specific sex? So, is it that empathy only is for women? Is is characterized by women, or is it social conditioning? So, could empathy also be a trait that men also have? Uh, a study in the University of Cambridge looked at uh, DNA tests of 46,861 men and women, and they only found 10% of differences in empathy when determined by genes. Also, there was no correlation between empathy and the participant sex. So really, it is not related. These characteristics are not related to a man and a woman. It is socially. Uh, so let's look at some responsive countries led by men, and they did really well. Look at, look at Bhutan. So Bhutan is a country, it's a small country of 700,000. It is known as, a couple of years ago, as the happiest country in the world. Zero cases out of a million. Yes, small country, but what was great about them is that they had this communal systems, they worked together, they listened to one another. The king listened to the health, system, to the health provider. They, they worked in a communal way and a cooperative way. Vietnam, 0.4 out of a million, again, they were quick in respond, responding. They use traits that are more of a... So uh, let's, let's look a little bit about uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, Senda. Look at her combined strength. She has strength, decisiveness, and compassion. But we know compassion is a feminine trait, right? But decisiveness and strength, Angela Merkel, assertiveness and empathy. Justin Trudeau, he has empathy, communication, and unity. So there are these combination of traits where there is a balance between the natural feminine and the natural masculine within a person. So the natural masculine, which is discipline, courage, clarity, protection, confidence, strength, in combination with uh, uh, understanding, nurturing, empathy, they come together into the, strength, the strongest leadership. So whether you're a man or a woman, if you have these combination together, strong combination of feminine and masculine traits, then your country is doing the uh, best when combating COVID. So what's happening in the MENA region? I'm going to look at Jordan, UAE, Morocco, and Tunisia. I'm going to start with Jordan. In Jordan, uh, the number, as of these are two days ago, three deaths per, uh, actually a week ago, three deaths per million. Um, the policy was very, the approach when it started was very feminine approach. Uh, the Minister of Health came every day at 8 o'clock on TV 
spoke to the people, spoke compassionately, spoke, spoke empathetically. He said, we need to work together to combat the problem. We listened to the World Health Organization. We listened to the, uh, to the health uh, workers, and it was a, a collaborative approach. Uh, UAE, similarly, by the way, UAE was known to do a lot of testing and tracing. Uh, they were known also to use innovative approaches, and they were planning actually for the future. Tunisia as well, the king <clears throat> was very committed, co co collaborative. He were, used public awareness, and they acted swiftly. And similarly, Morocco, with very little uh, death uh, rates. Um, where we didn't really do too well was in uh, Egypt, uh, where there are only 56 deaths per million, but only 1,314 testing, which meant that there, didn't, there wasn't massive testing, it wasn't very clear, they weren't very transparent, and um, information was very contradictory. Kuwait similarly tried really hard. They started really early to do the lockdown. The problem is they didn't implement the lockdown. So there was, they started the lockdown, but there wasn't uh, implementation. There were delays and depressed. There was a disruption to the social interaction because people stopped um, uh, believing. And Iran, of course, complete uh, lack of transparency of what is going on. Uh, and the cases are only 5,000, while the deaths were 293. So, so as you see, the different traits of uh, masculinity and femininity, and how different leadership uh, traits are um, uh, are actually. Uh, controlled by your feminine and masculine uh, traits within you. What did we do at the WPP? We realized in Jordan that the space of leadership had a lot of men. So what we did is we featured a lot of the women in our social media campaign. These are the care workers. These are the ones who are making the masks in factories. These are the teachers that work. So we did a complete campaign online so we can feature women. Uh, there was this um, uh, very well-known ad also on social media where they portrayed Jordan heroes, uh, us women uh, as partners in progress uh, did a counter ad and uh, we put the Jordanian heroes, the women that actually combated the, 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 uh, the COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 is a very difficult time. Uh, this is our attempt to try to understand what type of leadership and traits that would actually affect countries and responses to countries. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Aida. <laughs> Thank you, Mayada. That was quite interesting. And I, uh, I urge everybody to ask questions. Mayada has done a lot of research for over 20 years on, uh, on, on gender issues. And if this is the chance for you to ask her questions and, and get her feedback on any questions you have. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our second panelist, Tamron Bachelor Adams. Tamron is an independent consultant working with Tomorrow Today Global. She focuses on team and individual development to bring out the best in themselves and in teams. Utilizing her background in psychology, she works with organizations to drive growth. Tamron is a counseling psychologist in private practice in Cape Town, South Africa. And she is also a registered Enneagram specialist. So that's why we are also very excited to, to hear about this test. She will talk to us about how we see the world, how to develop our emotional quotient, and she will tell us about the Enneagram test, and finally, to take away with us awareness tools and to see how our personality type dictates our leadership style with a particular focus on times of crisis. So, Tamron, welcome to Dive in Jordan. Thank you so much, Ida. It's so wonderful to be here, and this is such a privilege, um, especially in an uh, kind of a opportunity like this that celebrates diversity and inclusion. Coming from South Africa, uh, you're probably aware that diversity is is really something we pay a lot of attention to. All right, so let's jump in. I'm going to share my screen. Give me one moment here, and. For those of you who might have seen that background, that was Camps Bay. It's a beautiful ocean down here in Cape Town, South Africa. If you're ever needing somewhere to come on holiday, this is your place. But here we are. We're talking about leadership and leading out of who you are with the context of being in a crisis. And as I said, I'm from Tomorrow Today, and we do a lot of work with leaders as consultants in Tomorrow Today. And we hold two pillars of belief when it comes to leadership. 
One is that you lead out of who you are. We very often try to emulate other people or try and copy different leadership styles, but actually the leadership style that has the most effectiveness is leading out of who you are. And two is that leadership is always context specific. And right now we find ourselves globally in the context of a pandemic or in the context of a crisis. And of course that's gonna bring a certain level of color or a certain influence into how leadership happens and what leadership needs to look like during this time. So I think what's important for us to remember is that we don't all see the world in the same way. And with that in mind, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves that we also haven't experienced COVID-19 in the same way. Just looking at what Mayada presented about the ways in which COVID has impacted different countries differently is again a reminder that what has happened perhaps in your country and if you're based in Jordan is very different to what has happened in my country. And there are a lot of different factors going into that. But one of the factors that we're going to expand on today is thinking about our personalities, our individual personalities, and how that has shaped and nuanced our experiences of COVID. And this is quite simply for the reason that we don't see the world as it is, but we see the world as we are. So I very often say to people, it's almost as though when you're thinking about personality, you've got to think about it as a pair of glasses that you're wearing. And I'm wearing glasses, so it's always helpful. But imagine you're wearing glasses with like a green tinted lens and everything you see has a slight green tint to it. But if I said to Ida, Ida, what do you see? And her glasses had a red tinted lens. She would say, well, of course, everything is slightly red. And I would say, but no, Ida, it's slightly green. And so we often get caught in these loggerheads with people, whether it's colleagues, or family or friends because experiences are always nuanced through our own lens and our lens is fundamentally influenced by our personality. It's why very often you might find yourself frustrated in a meeting and leaving the meeting saying, oh, why can't everyone just think normally just like me? And it's that just like me that often gets us into trouble because they don't think just like you because they've got their own personality, a completely different set of experiences that are going to nuance how they're going to think, perceive, behave and interact in the world. So if I need to drive this point home a little bit further, I want you to have a look at this and Ida's going to help me out here. This is, a, this is known as the Coffers Illusion. It's an experiment that was designed by a Stanford University professor. I want you to have a look and see how many squares do you see? They're actually called coffers, and they're those kind of almost um, ceiling-like shapes where it's a square with panels that are embedded into it. Have a quick have a look around there, count how many panels you can see or how many squares you can see, and pop that into the Q&A. And I'm just gonna read out some of those answers to me. Shouldn't take you too long, you can do Basic math. Ida, anything coming through just yet? Not yet. We, let's give them just a few seconds to get some uh, answers in. All right. Okay. okay, I have 23. 23, yeah. I have 32. Okay, okay. I have 28. All right, so there's already some discrepancy in terms of how many squares you see. This was a piece of research that was done by, like I said, by the Stanford uh, University professor. And what it was done was to show the ways that different people see the world. So here's another question. How many circles do you see? And this is where I'm normally met with that silence as people are suddenly racking their brains. I mean, the squares are easy. That was just to, to warm you up. But how many circles do you see? I'm not getting any answers. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting a very anxious, quiet audience because this is exactly what this illusion is. I, 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 I have an answer that says none. <laughs> well, I hate to break it to you, but as these circles are bringing up, you can start to see that there are multiple different circles embedded in between the squares. And once you start to see those circles, it's yes. almost impossible to stop seeing them, isn't it? Thank you wow. for that help, Ida. So the, really, the point of this was that they, decided, they discovered this kind of insight by accident. It was an experiment that wasn't designed as a psychological hallucination or an illusion. It was really just to show foregrounding and backgrounding. And they did this experiment with over 900 people and about 800 or so came back saying that they could see squares, but then a certain number came back saying that they could see circles. And that's when they realized, actually, there's a whole different perception that certain 
thing people are seeing. And what this highlights is that when you look at something and when I look at something, there's a very good chance we can see two completely opposite things. A lot of that is based on our, our history, our culture, or our personality. For those of you who didn't get the circles, don't worry, here's another opportunity. And Ida, I'm going to pull you back in here. I want you to just write one or two lines about what do you see when you look at this picture. And Ida, you can let me know what people say. They might be a little bit more skeptical this time because they know I'm here to trick them. But I have I have one comment that says, oh my God. And that is when you showed them the circles. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a, another image. Uh, there's a, a woman walking along a path. There's a tree and a bench. She looks like she's on her cell phone. Um, how many of you can see the giant sea? I have, I have a few that have seen, have seen the sea. Brilliant. OK, so now you're a little bit more awake. You're a little bit kind of smarter for the second slide. And that's exactly it. This is another piece of what's called an illusion. This is taken by a wonderful book that I could highly recommend by Amy Herman. She writes on visual intelligence. And Herman's book really is a book that illuminates that when we see the world, there are going to be so many things that we are missing because we're almost not trained to be able to see them. So a huge amount of her work is helping leaders to see the things that they are that are hidden in some ways in plain sight. And it's a really helpful book in terms of our thinking. How do we do those kind of four things that are listed on the side? How do we most importantly learn to adapt? And in our adapting, we learn to start to see the things that perhaps previously have been ignored by us or have been completely blind to us. Why am I talking about this? Why is this relevant now? Because we're all going through a massive season of adaptation. We are going through a season of change. And as a psychologist, I'm very aware that change is difficult because change encompasses loss. Even the changes that we want, if you get married or you move to a new country or you start a new job, inherent in every single change is an element of loss. And that's why it's such an emotionally turbulent time. Have a look at this graph. This shows generally the type of emotional trajectory that people go through when they're going through change. And think about your experiences in COVID, perhaps when you were told you can't go to work, you need to work from home. And then you were told you have to try and look after children while you're working from home. And then for some of you, it might have been the return back to work. So there's another change happening there. I want to draw your attention to that middle panel because that's where the reorientation or the real distress normally comes in, where you feel like you have undirected energy. You can see that there's conflict, high stress, realization of loss. That is the more difficult part of the emotional uh, spectrum when it comes to dealing with change. Interestingly, some research from around the world in the UK, they showed a 54% higher increase in people feeling a sense of loneliness and sadness during this COVID period. I looked at a research report recently that came out of Jordan, one of the largest pieces of research looking at the emotional impact of COVID that has happened in that area. And it showed that up to 23.8% of student population felt an increase in depression. That is an enormous amount of the population. And if you think about students in particular, their experience of learning has been completely pulled out from underneath them with a huge amount of uncertainty of what's going to happen next. Up to 13.8% of the population found an increase in anxiety in Jordan students as well. And so what you start to notice is as you progress through this COVID pandemic or the lockdown or the not lockdown, you start to oscillate between these emotions. And that is why so many people are starting to feel a real sense of burnout at this point when it's been about six months into this experience and your emotional fatigue is really starting to weigh in. So what I want to pull us back to in terms of just the introduction to why we're going to be using the Enneagram is because, again, we're going to see and experience the world COVID leadership through these different lenses. And there are multiple different lenses. There's language and culture and gender, as Mayada has highlighted to us already. But the one that I'm probably most interested in because of my professional background is personality. And one of the frameworks that I find incredibly helpful to understanding personality is the Enneagram. The Enneagram originated out of South America by a Chilean uh, professor who was a professor in psychology. And then it's evolved and expanded over the years since then. The Enneagram simply means nine types. 
Enya is nine and gram is picture or drawing. And that's why you get that shape that you get. Sometimes people get a little bit anxious when I show them this Enneagram picture because they think it's something religious or, or something kind of evil, but it's really not. It's just a way of representing these nine different types of personality. And I've used this Enneagram frameworks with different organizations spanning across 30 different countries around the world. And I think for me, that's where the proof is in the pudding here, because every time I do the Enneagram, it resonates with people, regardless of their cultural background or their generational age. It's a framework that is really, really kind of applicable to understanding why can't everyone be normal just like me. I think what I want to really emphasize here is that normally when I do the Enneagram workshop, I do it for a day. So what we're doing here is really just giving you a trailer or a taster to understanding the diversity in personality and its applications to leadership. I want you to think about this as if you're learning a language. And if I said to you, you're going to come out of this workshop being able to speak pure Spanish, you would laugh at me because that would be absolutely ridiculous. And the Enneagram framework is a little bit like learning a language. So you might come out of this being able to say hello, bonjour, uh, or one or two things when it comes to this framework. But to really understand it, you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper or contact me afterwards, and then we can start to think about how we can teach it to you in a more ongoing basis. All right, let's dive in. So here we have the nine different types, and the Enneagram is made up of these nine different types. A lot of authors give each of those types different headings. These are the headings that I've chosen to use for today. Challenger for the eight, peacemaker for the nine, planner for the one, helper, achiever, dreamer, thinker, questioner, and the playful one, or often referred to as the jester. Some of you might have done an Enneagram assessment prior to this, so immediately you know, oh, okay, I'm a two, I'm a one, I'm a nine. Some of you have never even heard of this word, and this is all completely brand new. What I want you to do is think about yourself, and think about maybe two or three people that you know quite well, a spouse or a colleague, or even a child, if they're older than adolescent, if they're in the early adulthood kind of age group. And why I say that is because personality is developed in the first seven years of an individual's life, but it only really comes to the full force in your early adulthood, um, which is why when I'm lecturing, I often tell people don't marry too young because the full personality hasn't quite emerged until about 25. Anyway, let's not get too distracted. Have a look at these different words and see if any of them jump out to you. Like, yeah, I know that I'm often told that I'm a really good planner or I know that I'm, I'm a deep thinker. Think about your spouse as well. Then then maybe just jot down that you're going to be looking at the numbers six or the numbers two for yourself and, and another number that might resonate with one or two important people to you. And then we can start to think if maybe they could be that number as we go through. This is a way for us to think about understanding each of these nine types in a little bit more detail. I always start with the eight, and that's because the eight is the strongest personality on the Enneagram framework. The eight is often called the asserter, or the person who kind of pushes action. Their world motto is, come on, let's get going. They don't like to waste time, they get things done. They're very often good at turning out an organization. If a whole organization needs to be turned over, the eights are the ones to do that because they are very, very strong individuals. You can often feel their presence uh, as they walk into a room. But there's a little bit of a secret hidden part about an eight because as much as they might come across as bold or sometimes brash or harsh, they actually are almost like marshmallows wrapped in barbed wire. And a marshmallow is a very soft, kind of gentle piece of sweet or confectionery that we have in South Africa. So think of something like a jelly baby or something soft wrapped in barbed wire. And so they come across as these very kind of bold, harsh people, but actually they have a heart that is so clearly orientated or attuned towards protecting the vulnerable. They can spot injustice almost immediately. And so all of their actions and all of their attempts are really to kind of protect the vulnerable amongst them. The nines on the Enneagram profile are called the peacemakers. The nines are almost the exact opposites of the eights in some ways. The nines are very easygoing people, easy to get along with, gentle, relaxed. They like to work in a calm and content environment. Their leadership style is participative and inclusive. They like to share. They make really, really good diplomats or really good uh, mediators because they're good at hearing both sides of the story. 
they sometimes struggle to make decisions because they can see both sides of the situation very clearly. And so you often find them sitting on the fence a little bit. The ones in the Enneagram are referred to as the need to be perfect. These are people who you can normally spot quite quickly. You walk into their office and everything is in order, or you walk into their home and things have a very clear place. They are orientated in the world through a very right, wrong lens. What is the right thing to do? Let's do the right thing. Their leadership style is one of setting high standards and leading by example. And so they can come across very often to other people as quite critical. They're the person who's going to notice a typo in your email and point it out to you. So if you've got those people in your workplace, they're probably ones. What's interesting about the ones is that as much as they might feel critical to other people or the world around them, they're actually really critical on themselves. And so they often have this harsh voice telling them where they've fallen short or where they've done something wrong. The two is the helper. The two is probably the most gentle on the Enneagram. They're often found in spaces of social work or teaching or nursing because they have a heart for people. Their leadership style is leading through service. And so what the twos battle with most is saying no, because their self-esteem is fueled by feeling like they need to be needed. All you have to do to know if you're working with a two is go up to them and say, I really need you to do X, Y, and Z, and they will drop everything and go and help you. Now, this is hard for twos because very often they get pulled into the boss's office and get told, you need to learn time management. You know, you're always late on your deadlines, but it's got nothing to do with time management. The two is probably doing more than you doing in your, your normal 24-hour day. The two needs to learn how to say no. And so that's the hard work for the two. But they are really kind of referred to as the cheerleaders or the appreciators or the encouragers, and that's their leadership style. They're also the person in the office who always remembers your birthday. So that's another way you can normally spot the twos. The threes are the need to achieve. These are often very good salespeople. So if you're working in the insurance sector and you're a salesperson, start listening up. Threes are achievement orientated. They goal orientated. If you give them a set of goals or a set of kind of this is where you need to be, they are the fastest ones to be able to get there. They also don't mind skipping a few steps if that means that they get to the end or they, their goal faster. They are meticulous around kind of how they come across. So they come across very well presented. Um, they are very, very good salespeople for that reason. They've got a high level of energy and they're really good at getting a whole team towards achieving a certain type of goal because they're orientated towards success, moving quickly up the corporate ladder. The four is often referred to as the romantic or the need to be different. Fours are big picture thinkers. They're often found in HR because they are very well attuned to the emotional needs of other people. They also like to stand out a little bit. So if I said to you in an organization, we are all gonna dress exactly the same, the four hears that and inside they just crumble because they can't stand the idea of being exactly the same as everybody else. So on the day that everyone has to arrive dressed exactly the same, you'll find the four's got like a flower in their hair or a big brooch on their uniform, just something that differentiates them from everybody else. So those are fours, very emotionally attuned to other people. They are driven by mood. So if you've got a four in your team and you know that they're in the, the capacity to work, they can produce huge amounts of work, but they are mood driven. And so sometimes that can be very difficult for them to manage. The five is the thinker or the need for privacy. Fives love knowledge. They're often found in university spaces and research organizations. They seek their own privacy. They don't like to be put into situations where there's lots of social or emotional demands or expectations placed on them. They're far more comfortable kind of sitting by themselves and getting their work done slowly and carefully. They love doing research. And so their leadership style is often, follow me, I know what I'm doing. And they really do know what they're doing. They're quite quiet people. They very seldom speak unless they're spoken to. But when they do speak, what comes out of their mouth is pure gold. And again, think about your organization and the teams you work with. If you have a five, they're normally the last person to speak in a team meeting. But when they speak, they probably have the most value in terms of what they say because they think carefully before they contribute. Sixes are your risk adverse. I come across a lot of sixes when it comes into auditing because sixes are 
almost personality trained to spot risk and anything that could potentially go wrong. They're the glass half empty kind of people sometimes because they can always see where something might be going a little bit off course. And so the sixes need to work hard to know when to share their opinion because sometimes they say, oh, that's not going to work. But it's at a point in the, the process where actually you just need encouragement. Sixes are incredibly loyal and they are excellent troubleshooters in a team. So they are people that are, are really analytical and have a strong analytical eye for things. They're very good at seeing detail. And then the sevens are the jester or the playmaker. And these are the people in your team who you know are going to bring a bit of a laugh to every team meeting. They're normally quite upbeat. They're normally quite playful. Uh, they normally have seven different things going on at one time. If you say to them, what are you doing this weekend? They'll give you a list as long as they are of all of their activities. Because as much as the five doesn't like so much social demand and expectation, the seven normally loves that kind of thing. And so it has a huge level of uh, social orientation. If if the glass is half full for the six, the glass is half, sorry, if the glass is half empty for the six, it's going to be half full for the seven. And so before I even move on from here, now that you've seen all of these different types, you can realize how having these different personalities in a team can lead to some tension and conflict. If I'm presenting a new project or an idea and I've got a seven in the team going, ah, oh, that is brilliant, let's do that. I can't wait to get involved. But the six is going, actually, I can see a huge flaw in that problem. You can see how those two are immediately going to start to butt heads. You might have a five in the team who sits very, very quietly, and you might have an eight in the team who talks very, very boldly and assertively, but the two of them have very different opinions that don't come out until right near the end. And that's why understanding personality is so pivotal when it comes to being a leader, because so much of leadership is actually people management. If you are struggling to find yourself, this might be a nice fun way for you to do it as well. Think about what is most commonly on your mind before you go to bed and have a little look at that list over there. Again, you can see that certain personalities are orientated towards certain things. The one, the sense of being critical with themselves, thinking, I could have done a better job with. The seven, who's like orientated towards future opportunity. Tomorrow, I want to, already dreaming and thinking. The five, who's knowledge base, the origin of, perhaps even more relevant for today, is in a Zoom meeting, which might you be? Are you logging on early, prepared you possibly a one? Who's checking in on the emotional well-being of everybody else in year two? Or analyzing how this webinar could have been more efficient, a three? Putting thoughts into your backdrop, a four? Not speaking for an entire Zoom meeting, a five? Asking those clarifying questions, a six? Definitely have a bowl of snacks or thinking about what you're going to do after this webinar, the seven? doing other things during the meeting because you've got a lot on the go, the eight. And if you're secretly wearing pajamas during this webinar, but actually have something professional on the top because you really just want to be comfy, you could well be a nine. So again, this is not the real way that you find out your Enneagram type. Normally you read through the book or you do an assessment that's like answering about 130 questions to give you your type, but we haven't got time for that. So these are just fun ways for you to think about it. What about under stress? Because all of these individual personalities, all of us, are going to revert to something that might be a little bit different in times of crisis. And there's two different types of stress. There's acute stress, which is when there's an immediate trauma or an immediate crisis. And what happens in that is that a different part of your brain is activated, your amygdala is activated. And that gives rise to your cortisol levels and it puts you into that fight, fight, freeze, or flight response. Once that starts to settle, there's another type of stress. There's the more ongoing kind of chronic stress that I think we're starting to experience, at least I'm seeing a lot of in my consultancy work and in my practice work at the moment. The stress of what it means to be in a lockdown for six months so far with still no clear sense of certainty. And so if you go back to that graph that I showed you earlier, it's that kind of emotional fatigue that people are starting to experience now. So what happens to these nine different types in these conditions? Well, for the one, they start to become far more frustrated far more easily. Ones really work towards control. And so the one starts to take on far more than they can actually handle, trying to control as much as they possibly can when everything out there feels out of control. 
And so what happens to the one is they get frustrated, they often feel very unappreciated, and they lead to burnout much quicker than some of the other types. For the two, twos move into a space where they really also start feeling like they're not being appreciated. What's interesting about the two is they go from being the most gentle people in the Enneagram to sometimes all of a sudden becoming quite harsh or quite aggressive or quite hostile. And the people around them are saying, what's going on? This is not normal behavior for a two. But a two under stress starts to become far more aggressive than they even aware of that they could manage or even comfortable with. The three, the achiever on the Enneagram, the person who is goal orientated and very, very quick to move towards success, can almost hit this kind of immobility, this desire to not do anything and just want to completely chill. And again, you can see how this can be really confusing for these pe people individ individually because they're so used to being success orientated and now suddenly they just don't have the motivation or the energy. And that can be quite distressing for them at a psychological level. For the four, the person who's again very emotionally attuned and very empathic, Fours, because they're taking on so much of the emotion of other people around them, a little bit like the twos, can also lead to a level of burnout. Fours often then move in between wanting to help people because they want to be in the emotional kind of intensity of it and wanting to resort back to their own kind of privacy and their, reserve their own energy. And so they do this push-pull the whole time. For the fives, the people who are normally very well organized in the sense of their own knowledge base and kind of liking their own retreat, fives become very scattered. I've been amazed at how many five leaders I've worked with who I've spoken to in the last month and they've just said they just feel numb. They feel completely disconnected from any kind of work that they were doing. They don't feel like they can sit down and concentrate for long periods of time like they used to, and they're feeling increasingly scattered. So that is a very stressful position if you're a five leader to be in. For the sixes, they become increasingly competitive. It's almost as though they go into overdrive mode and they try and think, where can we become you know, a little bit safer? Where are the biggest risks and how can we mitigate against those? And so what's running in the sixes mind is this treadmill the whole time of what if, what if, what if, which again leads to a huge amount of emotional and mental fatigue. When it comes to the seven, the person who is the most playful in your team, you might find them starting to become quite rigid and trying to become almost again, almost a little bit like what you would expect from a one, overly organized, too controlling, um, and trying to almost think in very black and white logic. And I'll give you an example of this. I'm the seven on the Enneagram, and I found myself during the heart of the pandemic feeling completely overwhelmed and out of control with a certain situation. And so I started going and cleaning out my cupboards. And what started off as a good kind of opportunity to just become a little bit more organized, I suddenly found myself being quite pedantic. I wanted things in certain categories, and then I decided I want all of the coat hangers to be the same color. And I actually had to stand back and laugh at myself because this is nothing like my normal personality at all, which couldn't give two hoots about what my cupboard looked like. But because I was feeling under stress, my personality went into something slightly different or reverted to a slightly more kind of primitive version of itself, which needed to find that order and control. And then, of course, we've got the eights. I think the eights have been one of the most interesting in terms of a leadership response that I've been exposed to because I've had some eights who have gone a little bit like the fives, completely numbed out and removed themselves completely. And then I've had a lot of eights who have gone, let's galvanize the situation. This is a challenge, let's rise to it. And they've actually moved towards the pandemic with a huge amount of energy. The difficulty is that the energy is hard to sustain because this pandemic has gone on for so long. And so what started as a really strong motivation, kind of getting the team and the organization into this kind of movement or resistance against this global pandemic has now starting to wane. And so they're starting to feel that level of detachment coming in for them as well. The nines, the nines are often the people that you that forget how to think about themselves. And so nines can often feel very withdrawn from other people. They might feel like they are invisible and they might also start to hyper focus. So instead of being able to kind of just kind of go with the flow, they become quite pedantic about finishing a certain task at the expense of all the other tasks. So they're hyper focusing on one thing again for an element of control. And so this is the way that we can start to see all of these different personality types acting very, very differently under these stressful situations. What does this mean for leadership? And that's why we're here and that's what we need to be thinking about. 
Well, as I said earlier, you know, leadership is not just about technical skill. In fact, leadership, according to research by Daniel Goleman, is only one third technical skill. Two thirds of leadership is people management. And people management comes down to being able to have the emotional intelligence to know how best to work with the people around you, how best to bring out their best, rather than assume that your way, your lens, your normal is going to be their experience. So the importance of self-awareness work in a crisis, I cannot overstate enough. When we think about what self-awareness work is or what EQ work, emotional intelligence work is, I like to put it in these kinds of blocks because it helps us to understand the importance of this. Emotional intelligence starts with self-awareness and self-awareness is not just kind of knowing the basics of who you are, it's understanding at a deeper point your personality, why you are the way you are, so what were some of the kind of pivotal experiences that might have shaped your personality, what are your triggers? What are those buttons that people can push? Because if I asked you to think about the certain types of people that always irritate you, you could probably come up with a bit of a list. And there'd probably be some themes that we could correlate on, across those different people on that list. You've got to have certain trigger points that are always going to be activated. So self-awareness is knowing what those are. And then self-regulation is the ability to say, I can feel I'm triggered. I need to hit a pause button and then respond. And this is the difference between leaders who have developed their own emotional intelligence and those who don't. Because emotionally unintelligent leaders feel an experience, quickly have a reaction, and then act on it without really hitting that pause button and taking into consideration that maybe they're acting out of their own stuff rather than what is really going on around the table in a meeting or in the room. Once you've developed the ability for self-regulation, you understand motivation better. You understand that what motivates you is not going to necessarily motivate the person next to you. So from a leadership perspective, knowing your team, knowing their personalities, and knowing what motivates them is hugely beneficial, especially during a pandemic like this, where the ordinary motivating factors have gone a little bit out the window in, in the event of people working from home. You also have a greater capacity for empathy because you can understand that how you see the world and how I see the world might be quite different. So instead of assuming that I am right, I see an opportunity of difference as an opportunity to learn. Tell me more about your experience and how, what can I learn about that that can better equip me as the leader to be able to manage that. So all of these build up towards social skills. And leaders that have accurate or good social skills are those who are going to be far better equipped to bring out the best in their team and others, especially during a crisis or a pandemic. When I've done work with leaders and, and different corporates over these last six months, there's been three interesting themes that have emerged in terms of how to lead effectively in a crisis. And this is by no means the only list, it's not exhaustive at all, but I think it's three important things that I want to leave you with today. If you are leading a team, or if you're leading a family, uh, or if you're leading an organization. And the three things are, think about communication. And my uh, presentation highlighted that, that there was a certain communication style that each of the different leaders had that really benefited their particular approach to dealing with the pandemic. People in a crisis need frequent and consistent communication. It needs to come from someone within your organization who's calm, someone who is able to communicate effectively, and it just needs to keep happening. You'll be surprised at how often people say to me, I just wish I knew what was going on. I don't know what is happening in that boardroom. No one ever communicates to us. And all that does is it leaves the people in your organization feeling anxious, feeling uncertain, and going to worst case scenario. So you can mitigate against a lot of anxiety in your organization if you think about who is doing the communicating, what are they saying, and how often are they saying it. Even if the communication is just, we haven't actually got any updates, that's the update. That alleviates people's anxiety. It's shown to drop their cortisol levels. The other aspect is thinking around compassion. Just be aware that other people are not going to be going through this pandemic or this experience the same way that you are. And that's why a framework around diversity and inclusion, exactly like this offering is doing, is a really important one. Because how can you factor in that people have different experiences and how can you make sure that they all feel included during this time? And the last is reflect on what this, this pandemic is showing you in terms of your existing culture within your organization. 
how has your company or how has your team responded to this? And what does that reflect back to you about what the culture is? Have people become very divided? Have people become quite fracturous? Have people banded together? Have people shown generosity towards one another or a greater sense of belonging to the team or the organization? Think carefully about what you could actually learn about your culture in terms of your organization through this pandemic. Again, the organizations that I have found have lasted or been most efficient in managing this pandemic are the organizations that have an existing culture of developing emotional intelligence in their leadership and in their employees because they've done all of that step work already. And when a crisis hits, they're not suddenly trying to understand what their trigger points are. They already know. And they're sitting up at that empathy and social skills level where they can act quickly and effectively in terms of managing and mitigating that anxiety for other people. If we return to the Enneagram and you think you might know your number, then have a look here. These are some suggestions or tips in terms of what you can do uh, as your different Enneagram types to manage your stress. Have a look at, for example, the number ones. It's around creating times of rest because ones struggle to know how to rest. They can learn from sevens in that regard because sevens are very good at being playful and restful. The fours, set daily goals for yourself. Try and provide some structure for yourself. Fours work well under structure, but often they become overwhelmed by their emotions. And so kind of bring it back in, find some structure. For the sixes, ask somebody else to keep you accountable. And this might just mean meeting up with somebody and debriefing some of your thoughts so that you don't end up caught up in your own head all the time with nobody else to kind of challenge some of that thinking. For the sevens, time block. Sevens generally overcommit themselves and then find themselves feeling burnt out or unable to meet the expectations of other people because they've committed to too many things. So block certain amounts of time to do different tasks and then feel the happiness of success once each of those tasks are completed. For the eight, delegate. Because eights are very kind of protective around their own vulnerability, eights move towards control and want to manage everything. But actually, when eights start to get delegate in a leadership position, they free themselves up to be the kinds of leaders that they want to be and the kind of leader that, especially during a crisis, their team needs. And for the minds, claim your role. Create spaces for silence. Allow yourself just to sit and decompress, because for a nine, that is really important. So again, I'm aware that if you haven't done the Enneagram assessment, that this is really just a little bit of a stab in the dark for you, and that there are lots of different ways that you can learn more about this fantastic framework, and I really can't stress that enough. Um, you're welcome to contact me or contact tomorrow today, and we can think about how to do the Enneagram with your team. But even if you can't find yourself in terms of these four nine types, have a look at maybe just one of these keywords and think about what keyword grabs you. And maybe that's something that you can focus on in the week or the two weeks ahead, or maybe even just for the remainder of the day. I'm hoping that as your eyes run through that list, that something kind of intuitively jumps out at you. Again, as the seven simplifier jumps out at me, because even though I know it's hard for me to do, I know that that's what's important for me to start doing if I really want to be my most effective self. And in closing, here is a list of resources. These are some great books that might be of interest to you. And there's an Enneagram app if you're really interested in understanding this a little bit further. But I really just wanted to give you my contact details. And again, say a huge thank you to Ida and IGI for this opportunity. I think if we're thinking about diversity and inclusion, then understanding your personality and understanding your Enneagram of your team becomes such a helpful framework in doing that. And I can't think of a topic that is more relevant or more important than what we're dealing with now, especially in today's climate. So thank you very much, Ida. I hand the ball back to you. Thank you very much, Tamron. This was so interesting. And that's why when we were leading up to this event, we asked everybody to do a test, a simplified one or the detailed one, so that when they came on board, they would see what their personality, how it affects their leadership style, especially in times of crisis and in these times that we're staying in. So we know you're a seven now. I know Mayada is that unique eight. 
uh, I did the test and I'm a three, so I'm in danger of being burnt out. So I need to, the, the, the word that popped out for me was ease. So <laughs> probably after this dive in, I need to just take a few days off and, and relax. Um, if uh, Please contact uh, Tamarin if, uh, if you have any questions. She sent her details. Mayada also uh, will, set, will also send me her details if anybody has questions about what's happening in the MENA region. Uh, on the studies and research being done on, on, on gender issues in, in light of the pandemic, we can answer those questions. I have quite a few questions that have come in, but we have around 10 minutes uh, to deal with them. So I'm going to, the first question, Tamarin, is for you. And, and the question is uh, from Sarah. Uh, can personality traits change as you grow older? That's a really great question, and it's a complex answer. The first thing I think I need to emphasize is that personality, like I said earlier, develops between the ages of 0 and 7. So, and that is an alignment with developmental psychology. What happens is that those traits, although that they're there as traits, they don't come to the full force until you are in early adulthood. Now, your personality, because you can't go back and relive your 0 to 7 years, your personality cannot fundamentally change. However, you can grow or regress in some of those traits. And that's why the work of emotional intelligence is important, because that you can change your behavior and your perspective, which might look like to others you're changing parts of your personality, but you're actually growing or maturing in those traits rather than changing your core personality. If there is a significant trauma or there's a psychotic episode, that would be something that would be slightly different, and that would result in a neurological change, which again would look like a real significant change in personality. But the, the kind of neural network for personality itself is embedded in those early years, and because you can't relive those early years, you can't really change that component of it, just grow or regress. So you're, we're kind of stuck. <laughs> Thank you, Tamarin. Uh, the next question is from Ayada. Why do you think more men become leaders than women? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, okay. So, um, I mean, this has to do a lot with the care role that women are actually assuming. And it is not, I don't think it is common only for the MENA region. Uh, and Jordan, uh, although it is more prominent here, but women at a certain point, um, uh, they, they, when they have kids, they have a choice to make. And that these choices are the ones that actually gives them a gap in their professional career, in which later on they, or they come back, but then when it comes to leadership, it becomes very difficult for them to assume leadership. So I would want to put it into the care roles. There are many other answers to it. Among them is, how women perceive themselves as leaders. Uh, some studies in the MENA region uh, say that women would are, are harsher on themselves and believe that they are incapable of being leaders, although they may have even higher skills than the men in their same same kind of uh, um, uh, you know caliber. So uh, so it is about uh, how we see ourselves as women. It has to do with the care role. It has to do in a time when you have to really leave the job and sit at home and do the care work, which takes a couple of years away from you. So there are multiple issues, some related to their own uh, efficacy and their own ability, and others could be related to, um, to their you know, progression through, uh, through, the, uh, through the hierarchy. And um, uh, I don't know, Tamarin, if you have anything related to the personality, but these are some of the traits you've seen specifically in Jordan. Um, and sometimes policies also affect, like in Jordan, there's a policy, there, there is like a a, a, a gender bias policy where they, you can actually retire at the age of 55 as women, but men can retire at 60. So when you're at the top, at the age where you can assume leadership role like ministers or uh, and so on, they actually uh, go out and, and retire. So so these kind of stuff is related to policies, related to personal issues, and related to other care issues that she's burdened with. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that as well. I mean, I agree 100% with what Mayara has highlighted. And maybe to add a fourth component is social modeling, um, which I'm sure Mayara will agree with. You know, there's just often not as many social role models or um, the narrative or the idea of little girls looking up at strong leaders, women, that set a precedent for them as many as there are men. And so when something is more normalized in society, it makes it easier for a child or an adolescent to believe that they can become that thing. 
And when you're not seeing that and you're not exposed to it, it almost eliminates it as an option, which I think is why advocating for gender equality and women leaders is so important for the younger generations. Thank you, Mayad and Tamrin. So role, role models are also very important and um, a lot of more than one factor apparently leads to that. I have a question from Dana and uh, Tamrin, that's for you. Uh, can you be more than one type, like a dominant and a subdued type, or you're just stuck in one type of personality? So again, you know, this is if we were, had time, we could go into the depth of this. And this is why I like the Enneagram, because very often different personality profiles. Sorry, are you hearing me okay? Okay. Very often yes. different personality profiles make you feel like you can only be one type, which makes you feel quite boxed. But the Enneagram has got lots of nuance to it. So if you were a four, for example, you would probably have a little bit of the five and a little bit of the three because they're your wing types that would influence your style. And then as you grow, you'll start to resemble some of the traits of the, the kind of number that you're growing towards. But you don't change from becoming a four. You will always be a four. And so in one essence, yes, you are one type, but you are influenced and it's very nuanced around the different types of the Enneagram. And so that's why you can have two different type sixes, for example, who are the same type six, but look very different in terms of their behavior. So as I said, this was a bit of a taster to it, uh, a trailer. If we had to unpack it further, it would make a lot more sense in that regard. Thank you, Tamarin. Mayada, I have a, an interesting question for you. Um, are women in the MENA region worse off due, due to the pandemic than in other parts of the world? How have they fared due to the pandemic? So what the pandemic done, uh, done is actually... Can you hear me well? I can hear background noise. Yeah. We so can what hear. The yeah, what the pandemic has really done is has accentuated already existing bias and inequalities. And the problem is, in the MENA region, there was already these strong biases and inequalities. In specific, when it came to women, um, women um, in, in employment or in jobs, so women, uh, the percentage of women that actually uh, are in the workforce in the MENA region doesn't uh, doesn't um, uh, is not more than 22 percent. In Jordan, it's only 14 percent. So yes, it has affected uh, women more possibly, uh, or let's say it has accentuated already existing inequalities. So gender-based violence has increased, although it has increased worldwide as well. Uh, women in employment has increased, uh, unemployed unemployment has increased because now there are choices to make. And in a in a in a company when uh, when an employer wants to make a choice and he's a male and he's a man, he, he is going to choose a man because he believes that he is the provider, the economic provider while women are the, are the caretakers, so they would assume uh, those. Even in the leadership scene, you see, we, see, we saw less women, and uh, as you know, I, even on, on TV and, uh, and, and all the, 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 uh, the response that we've seen, we saw a lot of men actually responding to the, uh, during the COVID, while a lot of the frontline workers, health workers, were women, and they were set on the, on the back. So basically what I'm saying is, and inequalities were all highlighted, and that's why the MENA region saw some of these uh, extreme inequalities. Thank you, Mayada. Uh, there is a question, Tamarin, for you, and this is from um, Sarah, who says she's a type 2, and she's asking, are certain personality traits more suitable for leadership, or can anyone be a leader? She's a, she's a helper, and she struggles to see how that would make her a good leader. Uh, Sarah, now is your time to shine. The world needs helpers. This is where you come to the fore. That's a really great question and such a commonly asked question. This idea of is there a single leadership prototype, so to speak? And the answer to that is no. And I think Mayad has highlighted that and I hope I've highlighted that in the sense that when we look at the different traits from a global perspective that have helped some leaders to be successful and others different, they all have different personality types. In fact, while Mayada was going 
going through the different kind of presidents or world leaders, I was thinking, I wonder if they had typed this or they had typed that. And so there's no kind of the eights are the strongest leaders or the fives are the strongest leaders. I think contextually, we do see some influence. So in countries like America, where assertiveness is a really valuable trait, you'll find a lot of people in CEO positions are eights or the more assertive of the personality profiles. But if we move across to Japan or Taiwan, where actually peacefulness and thinking and um, a far more kind of gentleness is, is seen to be a far more valuable trait, then you'll find nines or fives or fours or twos in far more prominent leadership positions. So Ken Blanchard, who talks about situational leadership, talks about the different stages that a team goes through. And a different leadership skill set is almost required at every stage of a team's development. The most emotionally intelligent leaders know that. And so if they are leading a team and they realize, actually, I am a, a type nine and I don't like a lot of structure, but I'm working with a very new team which needs structure and needs boundaries and needs that containment, I should step back and allow the Enneagram type one in my team to take over the leadership just for this period to help bring the team the structure that it needs. And then as the team matures and becomes far more self-sufficient, they don't need that micromanaging kind of leadership then I can step back in because then what they're going to need is my kind of leadership, which is a little bit more philosophical or a little bit more detached. And so to answer your question, there's no perfect type of leader. It's around the emotional intelligence and the maturity of all of the different Enneagram types that will lead to a strong leadership or a very weak and unhelpful leadership personality. Thank you, Tamron. I think Sarah is one happy lady today. <laughs> I have a question, Mayada, for you, and this is, I think, quite interesting. Uh, the question is, the COVID, lock the COVID lockdowns has forced companies to implement remote working. This inevitably leads to a different skill set for leaders. Does this level the playing field for men and women? Is this time for women to shine? Well, you would think it's a time for women to shine. The thing is, as you heard one of your team members as well, when, they, when we, we stayed at home and started working remotely, the, uh, the burden of household, house help, housework actually increased. And if there isn't the culture of men and women helping each other at, at work and doing the care work as well, then the burden becomes higher. And I am not sure if it actually gives an advantage to the women at home. However, if there was already the culture of sharing and collaborating in the house, then it would give, it would possibly be give a, a, an advantage to women. But at this point, it, I mean, specifically in our region, it actually added a lot of extra burden uh, on the woman from home, leave alone her children uh, at home and trying to teach the kids and uh, doing the, the care work and taking care of probably elders and probably the cooking and the whole thing. So I, I'm not sure if this actually uh, helped in the, in the process. I, I do have the staff and some of the staff really flourished. I mean, one woman we discovered so many, she is a, of course we did the study, we did the anagram test and she's a, a, a type five and she just flourished. She just had all these great uh, results and achievement, things I didn't even know about. So as a as a, managing, a manager of my own institution, I actually found traits in my team that were so different and so um, positive that it just made me look in a different way to, uh, towards them. So yeah, maybe it helped the leadership uh, as well. So. Thank you, Mayada. I think that takes care of all the questions and uh, that's about the time we have for this session. It was so interesting to hear from two really great women, each really shining in her field. And I think for me personally, it was, it was very insightful. I think we all will leave this session thinking about what personality type we are, how we can improve and become better. So thank you for our two wonderful panelists. Thank you, Mayada. Thank you, Tamrin. I want to thank everybody who has been with us today. Thank you for your time. I hope you found this session helpful and wishing you a beautiful day. I hope that the dive in next year, we will have a normal world and a better world for all of us. Please stay safe and stay well and stay healthy. And goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.